Welcome to the 45 Project. My name is Tomas Finta. Today I'm in Salt Lake City, Utah in the US and my guest is uh, Daniel John, strength coach, author, athlete, college professor. Um, have I missed anything then? Grandfather, father, crazy uncle, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what's your day like? Like fitting all these responsibilities and, and duties and roles? Uh, so what, what, what is that? How is that? Well, you know, it's funny because I like how, what's your day like. I, I always tell people, let's go back. Let's go back a little bit. I think the key to a good day is preparation for a good night's sleep. So my day starts with, oh, I don't know, about seven or eight o'clock at night. And you'll see it on my kitchen table upstairs. I have this little piece of paper and I write out my to-do list. And today, one of the to-dos was making sure I was awake for you. Yep. And uh, I, I set the... I, I make a pot of coffee and basically I wake up to the smell of coffee. That's what wakes me up. And then the alarm clock goes off about a half an hour after that. But it's a rare day where I'm not already up. So before I go to bed, to-do list, set the coffee. If I need to take any, uh, not anymore, but if I had to take a medicine or supplements, I would do that. Uh, and then really just kind of set myself up and kind of look at the day ahead and go, okay, here's a funny thing. Sometimes I look at my to-do list and say, well, why don't you just do it right now? And so I have to email somebody. So I'll email them at 7 o'clock, and then I'll do this other thing, I'll do this other thing, and I'll look at my to-do list for the next day, and there's nothing there. Right. So when I roll out of bed, almost universally I work first on my college classes, get those out of the way. After that, I do any writing that I have to do. Like if someone's asked for an article, or, uh, or if I'm working on a book, or... But I find working the first thing in the morning, writing to be very good for me. Mm -hmm. It's because for me, writing in the morning isn't a creative process. Writing in the morning is work. Mm -hmm. The creative stuff happens later in the day, when I take a piece of paper and I and I plan for the next day's writing. Mm -hmm. The other thing I think is, that, and this works for me, I don't eat until I've gotten all my work done, until I've done my workout, and you know, taking care of all the chores of the day. Then I eat, and the reason is, and it's a word from uh, hawking, you know, uh, hawking, you know, mm -hmm. where you train falcons, yep. and it's called Yarek, Y-A-R-A-K, right. and it gives you this, <laughs> this vision like this, you know, and I, yeah, and if I haven't eaten and I'm drinking, <laughs> and I drink a lot of coffee, it, I get things done, then I do my workout, and then I eat. And really, this is going to sound odd, but that's my working part of the day is done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm done by noon, and people say, hey, you're done by noon. It's yeah, but I got up at 5. I had a 7-hour day. <laughs> and so the afternoons are spent, like yesterday, I went out through the javelin with a friend of mine. Uh, the, my dog, Sirius Black, and I will go for a walk. And sometimes it's just creative stuff. I'll go... Okay, so there's this problem we're having, and uh, <clears throat> I see my gym here as like most people see a teaching hospital. I don't know if that's a phrase that's common, but teaching hospitals are hospitals where they're trying to train doctors and nurses. So I see my gym as a teaching gym. Mm -hmm. if, if there's a problem that comes up and someone says, boy, I do this exercise, but I don't get it. I don't, I don't know how to teach it. Or... The, there's a gap here. I'll go and play. I'll go around in the afternoon and play around with an exercise or an idea. And sometimes they fail miserably. And sometimes they become the goblet squat. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they become the suitcase carry. Sometimes. So that's basically a typical day for me. Um, the other thing I like is, you know, I also try to have a. I like to read every day something that's not part of my career. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know if you noticed when you came in, I'm rereading The Count of Monte Cristo right now. Mm -hmm. um, I try to read something or even watch a mystery or something like that. Just something to make sure that I'm not constantly spiraling into just strength and conditioning and professional stuff. Oh. And then uh, a big part of my life is uh, making a good dinner for my wife and when the kids were younger, my daughters. Um, and of course, and then... And then the evenings are wide open. It can just be sitting on the back deck drinking red wine and enjoying the sun, but it's there is no pressure. I, I try not to mix work. Well, 
there, there is no uh, separation sometimes between my no. work and my yeah. life because I love what I do. But I also have to make sure that I'm, I'm here for my wife, I'm here for my daughters, I'm here for my grandchildren, I'm here for my friends. Mm -hmm. My brain isn't going somewhere else, mm -hmm. which if you have a brain like mine, that's a real concern. <laughs> right. <laughs> so there you go. That's my typical well, day starts with the night before. It starts with preparation. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, how did it all start for you? I mean, a lifting, training, exercise, um, when you were at school, high school, when did it start oh, and no, how it was, and why? It was before that. It was 1965. <clears throat> Pardon me. In 1965, my aunt died. Uh, of course, we're an immigrant family, so an aunt and uncle is kind of a relative term. That very often, my family is there's no blood relations, but they're family, you know. And uh, she left us five hundred dollars, as I recall. And my brothers went to a place called Sears and bought the Ted Williams barbell set, a hundred and ten pounds, fifty kilo set. And they brought it home, and uh, they started lifting weights. And I, I made this goal of being able to pick up the bar with the 10 pound plates on it, you know? And I did, drug free. I did it. <laughs> <laughs> but that, I, they had this little booklet that came with it. And it's funny because a couple years ago on eBay, I found the booklet and I bought it. And I bought it for $37, which I think was more than the original weightlifting set itself. <laughs> so, uh, I just fell in love with this idea that you could go into this thing and the, you go walk over to this thing, and if you worked on it, you got better at it. Mm -hmm. And if you continued coming back, you could add more and get better. And then, but it was all self-motivated, self-disciplined. And, and, and I look back on that <clears throat> funny little moment right there, and it, it really ties into my whole life. Like with writing, when people say, how did you become a good writer? It's like, what did you think? I was walking down the street one day and a lightning bolt hit me and, you know, no, it's, but if you, if you decide that you want to write and you first, you write a little bit and it's not very good, but then you write more and then you write and pretty good, soon you have a, I mean, it's estimated that I have a thousand articles. Well, some of them are terrible, <coughs> but some of them are pretty good, you know, but it's the process. And I, I fell in love in about 1965, and by, um, oh, I don't know, by about 1970, 71, when I wanted to play American football, that's when I started taking it more seriously, and I went to the library, and for a young person like yourself, a library is a place where they have books, okay? I'm not that young. <laughs> I'm 47. <laughs> and, I, and I found a couple of books that uh, really kind of put me on a good path mm. at, in, in the world of... Uh, of performance and in fitness, uh, they were very simple things. You know, put the weights over your head, pick them up off the ground. Those were the basic workouts. And then they'd have a little mix of bodybuilding exercises after. But it was always put the weights overhead and pick them up off the ground, and then you mix in some stuff after. And I look at those, and I look at that time from 65 to about 1971, 72, 73, and I go, that's the foundations of my career. Pick weights up off the ground, put them overhead. Later on, when I got hurt, you know, carry him. <laughs> and that's, that's what happened. And uh, I began to notice over time that even though I was, I, I was because of the way uh, um, the school system where I was split, I was always the youngest boy in the class. Mm -hmm. And being Irish, I was always the last to hit puberty or the growth spurt. But it was okay because in this area of weightlifting, I was always ahead of everybody else because... Uh, they would lift weights one time a year and I would lift weights three days a week right. and I got stronger and stronger and stronger and then when finally uh, my body decided to spring uh, for uh, puberty I went boom way past uh, them and, and I just found that fascinating uh, I, there's a few times in my life I haven't been able to lift uh, that would be right after I got back from the Middle East uh, I lost 40 pounds in about two weeks to a, a, a parasite, and then I hurt my back uh, picking up a typewriter for, a, for our secretary. That was a miserable time, and I couldn't lift weights. So, 
so my, my doctor told me that I should swim and learn to bilateral breathe. He, can you know, this bringing motion here? Mm -hmm. And that I should go for walks. And then I should ride a bike. And I figured, well, swim, bike, walk, run. And I started doing these little sprint triathlons for about two years. Yep. Once my back came around, and backs are a funny thing. It, you, it's like getting hit by a lightning bolt when you hurt it. It's like, ugh! Yep. And you're in pain for a year. And then one day you wake up and it's like, well, an unlightning bolt goes out of you. It's like, where did that thing go, you know? Right. And when I was healed, I went back in the weight room and started working out again. And it was like, I made the quickest progress I've ever made in my life. I was back to fairly high strength levels in a week. And in two weeks, I started throwing the discus again. And I looked and the discus started going far. So in 1987, uh, I kind of started throwing the discus again. And my marks were amazing. And that's when I met my wife, Tiffany. And all of a sudden, my whole career started again. And the best period of my career, I've had two. So in the 1970s, as a college athlete, was my first really nice level. Mm -hmm. And then in, from about 87 to about 94 was my next <coughs> big hit. And then when the, my daughters got old enough that they could hit, I came, I started lifting again with Tiffany because she wanted an Olympic lift. And then I blew my wrist apart and my career was over and I started doing loaded carries and then I had the best seasons of my life in my late 40s. Oh. At age 47 was the best year of my career as a discus thrower. And, but then in 48, 49, age 48, age 49, age 50 were the best years of my Highland Games. So for uh, the viewers who don't know what Highland Games Oh, okay. Are. So it's the Scottish yep. Highland Games. Yep. You wear a kilt. Yep. Uh, there's seven events or nine events. Uh, you throw a heavy rock. You mm -hmm. throw a bigger rock. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the lightweight for distance. There's a heavyweight for distance. There's a light hammer. There's a heavy hammer. And then, of course, there's the caber, which is the big log, yep. which you'll see on the internet all the time. Yep. And uh, I, I, I won the, the largest Highland Games in the world, the Pleasanton Highland Games, two years in a row. And uh, famously stepping in a hole, uh, turning the caber to win one year. And I, uh, one of the people said, I heard a pop. And that's when I probably popped my hip out. Right. Um, just for the re uh, record, it wasn't sports that hurt my hip. I was born with a condition called pistol grip hips. Mm -hmm. And um, my brother, my cousins, my niece, we all have this same condition. And basically, you are a total hip replacement. The, you're going to have a total hip replacement yep. the moment you're born. And uh, so that that's a real quick story about how I mm -hmm. fell in love with weightlifting. From 1965 to 2019... Today, I've lifted weights almost three days a week the entire time. Well, um, understandably, when we're young, we have a lot of energy and, and a great desire to improve ourselves um, physically, whether it's strength or, or um, it's cosmetic true. looks yeah. or whatever the reason for, for exercising is. Uh, what motivates you today? You're uh, 61 years old, is that 62? correct? 62. So what motivates you to keep going with it? Well, you know, well, <laughs> it's, it's going to be emotional for me. Um, but it is to uh, dance at uh, my granddaughter's wedding. Mm -hmm. There's pictures of her all over the place. And, of course, my grandson, Danny, I, I love him too, but that's my motivation. Okay. Um, you know, she's five years old, so ideally 20 years from now. Mm. But, you know, you picked a tough day. Today's the 39th anniversary of my mother's death. Mm. And uh, yesterday, my coach from junior college died. And in June, my brother died. Mm. I tell people that my family doesn't live long. Mm. And people always think I'm kidding at workshops. And I'm not. Mm. If we don't die in America's wars, we die young. That's, and, and so for me, what I'm trying to do is, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do all those little small things. I wear my seatbelt. <laughs> I, I don't smoke. Mm -hmm. um, I drink water. Well, you wouldn't notice it because I drink so much coffee. But I, I drink water. I eat vegetables. I, uh, you know, I see the dentist three times a year. Mm 
Um, I floss my teeth every day. Um, I, uh, I sleep soundly. You know, I try to sleep eight or nine hours every night. Uh, I, I, I take time to breathe out and relax every day and have a glass of wine and do what we're doing right here and yep. talk. Yep. I, I try to maintain relationships. Uh, so for me, uh, going to the gym and training here is, is the only way I know that I can, you know, mm, sounds crazy, not die. <laughs> Doesn't sound crazy at all. <laughs> uh, you know, I, just, I, I want, all I can do is what I can do. Yeah. You know, and I can't, you know, if the angel of death is sitting right over there right now, well, then the angel of death is going to take me out today. But what I try to do is those small little things that keep me from, uh, uh, so I can be around a little while. Okay. And, you know, I, I tell people this, that my family dies young, and they dismiss it. But for me, it's actually one of those things where, I hate to call it a competition, <laughs> but it is... I, I'm so competitive. I know that, but for me, it's like okay, I'm gonna run. I'm gonna run those numbers. I'm gonna, yep, yep. I'm gonna try to beat these numbers, and and you do it by simple things. My wife is a Hemingway, and God bless the Hemingways because uh, they you know they have a, they have they have, they have some issues with you know suicide, but her family they live into their 90s without. I mean, mm. they. You know, they can smoke 17 packs of cigarettes every day and live to be 98. Yeah. My family, that's just not the way Different it goes. genetics, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Dick Notmeyer told me one time in the gym, he goes, you know, we, he goes, of course, Dick was my coach, and he was great. He's, I talked to him once a month. He, he'd go, so, Danny, what do you think's the secret to longevity? When he asked a question, it usually meant, don't answer it, I've got it for you. And he said, 50% is DNA, 40% yep. probably lifestyle. And 10% is luck. You went to the left or the right. You driving down the freeway and mm. someone text messages and you're out. That's bad luck. Or good luck. You know, you bump into somebody on a on a plane and they tell you, you know, here's the secret to life and you follow it. And, you know, that's good luck, you know. So that's what that's what motivates me. That's what motivates me. That's what uh, gets me out of bed and work out. Now there is, you know, you, you mentioned uh, cosmetics and aesthetics. There's a little bit of that too. I don't think of myself necessarily as vain. Mm -hmm. When you have a face like that, you don't. There's no <laughs> way you have to worry about it. But I, I do think it's cool. Like about a week ago, an Uber driver picked me up. We we're just talking about, it and, I, and she graduated from a local high school. And I said, "What year?" And she goes, oh, "Way before you graduated from high school." And I go, "Well, what year is it?" Well, she was ten years younger than me. And she thought she was, that I was younger than her. Right. <laughs> and I thought to myself, you know, that's worth three sets of eight. You know, that's worth pushing the prowler. Drinking that's worth, water. <laughs> drinking water. That's worth that's rolling right. out of bed to, nice. to be 62 when someone thinks you're in your 40s. You okay. know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so true, everything you said about yeah. it. That's, that's whatever motivates you guys. Um, um, just keep that in mind and that will that will get you to the next workout, that will make you drink that next glass of water. Um, yeah, you're right. It's So you, you, you got to look at it. You know, co I always say cost to benefit ratios. Mm -hmm. You know, working out is here's the cost, but here's the benefit. You know, that extra 15, 20 minutes, half an hour of sleep, the benefits, you know, might be here. I mean, it's... Um, Someone told me an interesting thing. So the idea is that, you know, it's all cost to benefit. And I, and I just read some interesting things recently about pressing the snooze button. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's such a small thing. Okay, I'm going to... My alarm clock goes on. And I reach over and I press the snooze button. And I get 10 more minutes of sleep. This article I read said, and, and I think it's true, that 10 minutes of sleep just told your brain you didn't have a good night's sleep. So you start off your day by, by having that extra 10 minutes of sleep. It's a massive cost and almost no benefit. Right. Um, we know, uh, I, I listened to a, a, a fabulous female doctor talking about female hormones on a podcast recently. And she said two things that just, just made my... I go, that's true. You need to go to bed within two hours of sundown for the rest of your life. 
and it's fun because actually I try to do that here in Utah. Of course, you know where we are in the latitude. That's what, you know I often go to bed when Tiff's on the road at seven or eight at night, very often. And then you go to bed within two hours of sundown, and when you wake up, you get up and go. Yep. And the reason is for your hormone profiles. It might be the best thing you can do for your hormones. And I'm thinking to myself, instead of ejecting, instead of popping a pill, mm -hmm. those two things are probably better for you than all the nonsense we do, well, all the non nonsense you see online. And it's funny because something as simple as hitting the snooze button can undo all that. So it's cost of benefits. And, uh, you know, the cost of smoking is here. And the benefits are probably not very high. Drinking water, well, that's very inexpensive here where I live. Yep, yep. But the benefits are here. And so what you want to do, I think, and this is true about every aspect of your life, is you just kind of want to make those cost of benefits. And you want to ride that wave right there where small cost, massive benefits. Mm -hmm. And you say it out loud and people are like, it, like you just did, uh-huh. And then I'll talk to somebody who goes, "Wow, oh, I just, I just feel so broken and so tired." Well, tell me about, uh, tell me about a typical night for you. Well, I, you know, and they lie to you because they have to. Yes. <laughs> but then you find out, and, and they'll say, "Did you watch this episode of this show?" Oh yeah. No. Mm -hmm. Did you watch this episode of that show? No. And then you find out that after dinner they sit in the couch, they drink twelve glasses of wine watching meaningless television, if I like a show, I buy the show, and then I watch it, and if it's a half hour show, I watch it in 19 minutes, because, mm -hmm. you know, without the commercials. Mm -hmm. And if it's an hour show, it's about, well now, it's about down to 40, 41 minutes. So yeah, I like the show, and I watch it in the afternoon. Okay, good, I'm caught up, thank you very much, out the, you know. That's right. But they'll stay up till 10, and, and, and television is so addictive. Mm -hmm because they keep showing what's coming up next. Oh, I've got to watch to find out whether, huh, today on Joey, or whatever the stupid show is, you know. Yep, yeah. And you just keep, and now it's 10 o'clock, and now it's 10.30. Well, now I got to watch, you know, whatever the night, tonight show is mm -hmm. now. And then I got to watch, and now it's 11, 11.30, you go to bed, the alarm clock mm -hmm. goes off at six, and you, hit the, you hit that snooze button, yeah. and and I tell people there's two things, and if it's okay if I go on, is this okay if I go? Sure. Rob Wolf has this great insight about how the body works. You lift weights, you lift weights, and there's this neurological response, and you add load. Because you're learning how to lift weights. You add load. Pretty soon the load gets to the point where the body goes, something bizarre is happening out there. And you get a hormonal cascade. Mm -hmm. And the hormonal cascade is that... That's that you're 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 taller, you're stronger, you walk taller, you you feel good, arr, arr, all those things. But the opposite, all up, and I call it toilet bowling. Of course, you live in Australia, so you have to be careful. I, you know, toilet bowl. He goes this way, here, the other way. <laughs> here, 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 here. We go this way, there you go that way. But toilet bowling is when you stay up till midnight, ten nights in a row, and get up at six and hit the snooze button. Your lack of sleep. Because you hit the snooze button, you don't get a good night's sleep. Well, now you don't feel very good, so you drink a cup of coffee, but that's not, not enough. So you have a sugar rush by eating a bagel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you might, as well just, you might as well just take crack cocaine if you're going to eat uh, empty carbs. Um, well, in half an hour, you, oh, I need something else, and you eat a candy bar. And then, and then your insulin rush kicks in. Well, to balance that, and, yep. and what happens with many people is, you begin to toilet bowl, mm -hmm. you know, and all of a sudden it's 10 years later and your doctor says you're pre-diabetic or you're diabetic. You have, you have your knees hurt, your, your hips hurt, your back hurts, and you've lost the spring in your, in your spine as you mm -hmm. walk. You know, you start, you lose your glutes. Yep. You toilet bowl. And here's the thing. There's a great book called The Brothers Karamazov, and, and there's a great scene in there where a woman comes to Father Zazissima and says, Father, I've lost my faith. And, and I'm summarizing a big thing here. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, how did you lose it? And she says, bit by bit. Mm -hmm. And he says, I remember that. 
Well, then you're gonna have to get it back bit by bit. Right. But here's the funny thing. If you're down here in the toilet bowl and you just say, okay, I'm gonna try to sleep better and I'm gonna quit snoozing. I'm gonna uh, prepare things the night before so that when I wake up, if you decide to eat breakfast when you wake up, um, I'm gonna have it in the slow cooker so I have no other choice but to eat oatmeal with protein powder the very first thing because it's sitting right there and it smells good and it's filled with all kinds of wonderful things. Mm -hmm. So now I'm eating oatmeal. Huh, I notice I don't, and I'm, I'm not hungry. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I don't need that bagel, that candy bar. And what happens is bit by bit, you come back. But it's, the thing I've noticed when people turn it around is that it took you 10 years to get where you're at it doesn't take 10 years to get back. In fact, weirdly, it's, it almost seems, I hate to say 10 weeks, but it, you, you turn around so much faster than you turn it yep. down. Okay. So that's the cost of it. Um, and that brings us to my next question and really good lead up to the next question then, so thank you for that. Is, um, how do you start, like uh, a 40 plus guy, you haven't exercised for a couple of decades, busy with work, busy with a uh, young family, paying your mortgage, commuting to work, an hour in the car one way, an hour back. Uh, you said it's gonna take a lot shorter to come back than it has taken to the toilet bowl down. Uh, but what are the mistakes someone can still make? I mean, it's a, it's a faster process, but there are mistakes yeah. to be made. The, the biggest mistake you're gonna make is with intensity and load. You're gonna try to, like you said earlier today when we were just talking beforehand, you're gonna try to train like a Navy SEAL. No, no. Basically, I see three areas, okay? Mm -hmm. One is mobility, uh, almost every, especially with men. Mobility, and mobility is the free movement of the joints. Mm -hmm. And I have a simple test I give. And not just the um, elbow joint for biceps. <laughs> yeah. girls, it's... So um, it's a simple test. I just ask you to hang from a bar mm -hmm. for 30 seconds. Right. Well, it's not your grip strength that holds you back. It's the fact that you, you can't, mm -hmm. you, that you're so locked up here, you can't get your hands overhead. Mm -hmm. So when I use this 30 second hang test, what I'm trying to show is that you're so locked up that we need to open the joints up, mm -hmm. literally open the joints. The next area is hypertrophy training. And yes, it is bodybuilding, but to me it's specifically in the areas of the glutes. Mm -hmm. You gotta get the glutes back online. So your butt muscles. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, your butt. We're sitting on a, <laughs> we're sitting on a gold mine right here. Yeah, because it is true, the, the butts are the, you know, <laughs> the butt reflects youth. If you've got a saggy butt, you know, you might have six pack abs and pecs and biceps, but when you walk down the beach and you got blah, 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 everyone know, everyone just judged your age. Mm -hmm. Firm buttocks is the key to, well, it's a fountain of youth and it's also the most, according to the research, what most people look at. Uh, Engine of movement? It's the, well, I'm, and I'm also talking about the opposite sex. The right. opposite sex <laughs> tends to look at the butt because that's an indicator of your fitness. Well, and your ability to reproduce. So to me, it's the butt, and then it's the muscles that do this, mm -hmm. and the muscles that do this. Mm -hmm. I didn't say horizontal. So this stuff, the overhead, the vertical work, mm -hmm. both in the pulling and the pushing, tend to do more work. So I always tell people, we gotta get your shoulders back online, we gotta get your triceps back online, we gotta get your ab wall back online. Mm -hmm. uh, the ab wall, I always tell people the best exercise is vomiting, uh, followed by laughing, and then, but you gotta teach the ab wall to brace again. Mm -hmm. And when we, when we get in the chance to go into, the, into, the, into my weight room, I'll show you some simple ways right. how we do right. And it can be, it can be ab wheels, but it also can be glute work as you embrace the ab wall. And then the third area, it's, it isn't much, it's walking. I prefer, I would much rather you walk than any other thing. And there's, there's two things that's coming up recently. Um, for, I was just listening to a podcast that really made me think about this. Stu McGill, he has a new book called The Gift of Injury. The Gift of Injury. 
And by the way, I think injuries can be a gift because it reminds you, I don't want to live like this the rest of my life. But in his book, he talks about the guy, the guy that he's building back up. He started to go for a 10 minute walk after every meal. And what happened is when you walk, you get that natural, first you start to, you know, when you first start to walk, you look like an old person. But after you start walking every day, you start to get the spring back. And that springy walk is really what rehabs the spine. It's what rehabs the back. It what rehabs everything. I then just read another thing that said 10 minutes before every meal. So Stu says after, this podcast said before. But I don't think it matters. But an interesting small thing. Three 10-minute walks seem to be better than a 30-minute walk every day. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, now this got me thinking, that makes more sense to me. So instead of having this one workout a day, here you go, you show up 23, hour, 23 and a half hours a day, you sit in chairs, you lay in bed, you watch TV, you drive your car, and then magically half an hour you're going to fix it all. And it can happen. Or you go sit, walk, sit, walk, sit, walk, and all of a sudden things change. Mm -hmm. So for me, hypertrophy and mobility, and I see that in a yin-yang relationship, as I mobilize my shoulder and build up and re reawaken my deltoids from my shoulders, my upper back muscles, these muscles, the triceps, and I, and I do some mobility work, the two of them work together synergistically. Mm -hmm. If I stretch my hips mm -hmm. and work my butt, my posture becomes better. The two are one. You can't really separate the two. And then walking brings the spring back. Mm -hmm. So that's how I see how you turn things around. That's um, great advice. So ground up, uh, don't start with the most complicated Olympic lifts. <laughs> no. and, um, and I I often say, guys, look, in your 20s, so as a teenager, you wanted, wanted to go to a music festival, show sure, pump up your biceps, great. Uh, in your 40s, that might not be the most important muscle in your body. Um, the glutes would be much more important. Yes. And your abs would be much more important. Well, I always tell the guys in their 20s, they'll say, I want to meet girls, and actually they actually say something different uh, instead of meet. And I say, uh, you know, man, if you learn how to talk like a human being mm -hmm. and learn how to dance, you'd be miles better than working your abs and your biceps. Uh, because if if your idea of how you meet women is doing this, swiping, you know, that's that's not how it really happens in the real world. <laughs> and you can get away with that for a while. Mm. And I, I always joke, you know, uh, when I'm out and, I, and I, I, have a, I have credit cards that are made out of uh, carbon fiber because uh, they're very high-end. When I pull that card out, let me tell you, a lot of people at the table go, whoa. So learn how to talk like a human being and, and interact with people mm -hmm. like humans and communal. Uh, learn how to be uh, an involved communal person. You're, you dance, you laugh, you love, and you'll do far better long term than whether or not you know, you're on am armacondas or pipe or pumped or not. <laughs> and the funny thing is I'll meet these young guys and they'll, and they'll go, yeah, I'm working my, and they'll make their muscle and I'm like, that's all, all that work you do, and that's all that's that's your cannon, that's your pipe, that's your that's your gun, son. Honest to God, learn to dance. <laughs> uh, a bit more personal question, then, if you don't mind. Um, what do you consider your three greatest achievements in your in your life? Well, you know, if my children listen to this, I would have to say. Kelly and Lindsay, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say, you know, being married to Tiffany, let's go personal. Um, I would say, uh, the, personal. Um, I would say my impact on the communities I'm involved with. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife and I have a, a, a mission statement called Make a Difference. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, just yesterday, um, one of my friends is trying to go to the World Championships and has a fundraiser. and. I just send him a bunch of money because that to me makes a difference. This guy works very hard in his community to make a difference and I'm trying to help him go on. Uh, athletically, in the, in the world of academics, I would have to say 
I wrote a thing on the, the Beowulf uh, story back when I was young. And I still go back to that and I, I look at it and I go, that was pretty, that was pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. The book, uh, 40 Years with the Whistle, uh, which, you know, it doesn't sell well, but I don't care. Um, like I told you earlier, you know, Coach Lahati died. And Skyline College is using that section of the book to talk about him. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, what a, what a tribute to not only Coach Lahati, but to what I wrote. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I gotta say, never let go academic, you know, because that, that book put both, uh, paid for both my daughter's educations. That was the first book I read from you, Never yeah. Let Go. Yep. Yeah, and that paid for my daughter's education, mm. so, I mean, mm. come on. But as an athlete, um, there's, there's several. There was one time at a Highland game where uh, I was losing, and there was an impossible caber to turn. It was impossible. And I was losing, and my friend Jeff Armstrong, and it was like, and I knew it. It, was, it, it all came down to this one turn, and the father of the other athlete said, well, son, looks like you got this one. And Jeff said, all of a sudden, you can just see. And when I walked over the caber, Jeff says to the dad, you just gave Dan the victory. And I, <laughs> and I picked it up and I ran and I lost control. I stopped. I picked it up and I stopped again. So dancing with a caber is not something you want to that do. The thing is, how, how, how long is it? Uh, the one there would have been about 18 feet, but it was 170 pounds. That's nearly six meters. The six meters, seventy-five yeah. uh, k. Yeah, and uh, and I ran again, and I flipped it. Perfect twelve win. You know, <laughs> that would be one. This would be a weird thing, especially for our international audience. But there's a game called American Football, <laughs> and uh, I was so prepared for this game one time mm -hmm. that when the Westmore, the other team, Westmore lined up. I was in this other zone, and I've been there a few times in my life, but when you can look at 11 people and know what they're about to do, hmm. I would go there like this, and I knew where the ball was gonna go. And I was making the tackle. The ball carrier would get the ball, and I would, I'd be right on him. And during the game, I'd go to the sidelines, and the, the, the local uh, news guy, uh, the, the reporter for the, it's called the Enterprise Journal, the newspaper, he would be like, well, that was a pretty good play. And I'd be like, and this is during the game, I'd be like, man, yeah. Because <laughs> I was so prepared and so aware, hyper aware of what was going on. Mm. And it, it's it's one of those white moments, you, it's hard to repeat. And then, and then athletically, there's, there's a couple, but when it was the national championship, the week before I broke my wrist, uh, when it all, it was a do or die attempt if I make the lift, I'm national champion. If I miss, it's not good. And Tiff famously told me to, very loudly, make the, she didn't say effing, but you can imagine, very loudly, very clearly, make the effing lift. And I made it because that was just like one of those times where, uh, so I, it's funny, uh, two of the three are do or die situations. Mm -hmm. And I like that. I like do or die. I like, I like that moment in sports and life where you step up or you don't. I yep. love it. Yep. And you know, uh, yep. one of my books is Can You Go? Yep. And I, honestly, I ask people that all the time. Like, you know, if you, you know, you're 39 weeks into a pregnancy and uh, baby's kicking mm. and you, guess what? <laughs> I don't care what you think. <laughs> In about a week here, you have a little, a little, uh, you know, little, skinny thing coming out, little tiny thing coming out that you're in charge of for a long time. Can you go? Can you go? Doesn't matter if you can or not, because here you go. Yeah. That's a good title for a book. Here you go. Then <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, there's, there are principles. I call them Ben John principles <laughs> uh, from your books and um, uh, attending your seminar in Australia. Um, to, to finish this interview, could you summarize the principles to, to live by according to Coach Dan John for guys over 40, or not just guys over 40, anybody really who wants to be fitter, healthier, stronger, have a better life? Well, I, I always start with our, our mission statement, make a difference. If, you know, you're on this earth, maybe for a reason, maybe not, I, I don't care, but 
you have a you have a brain and you have resources how can you leave this planet better than when you got here and that's been one of my goals since the beginning that's what bothers me so much about people who abuse the environment because you're not leaving the planet a better place or people who abuse um, they who, uh, others who they think are less than them that really bothers me and we should we should always leave the house cleaner than we mm -hmm. found it we should leave the gym clean you know i don't I, 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 my trainer ben fogel he, and and the other one uh, the, the, the other people help me I always think it's funny cuz i'm i always put my equipment away before i move on to the next <laughs> round of things yes. cuz i always try to leave it better than i found it yeah. um, the next <laughs> there's there's some of them that are just kind of silly but uh, but let's go to the ones that are important uh, the other one is to have a true balance in life. So you'll notice that when I talk about work, when I talk about rest, when I talk about play, and uh, the word pray, but I can also just mean um, alone time, I, I really think it's important to balance those three, those mm -hmm. four things. So if I'm going to take on more work, I consciously think about taking on more rest. If, and if this isn't fun, then I have to make it fun somehow. Mm. And then I also have to have a time for reflection and go, okay, you know, uh, it could be just walking my dog, it could be, uh, it could just be doing some creative work, it can also just be reading a book by mm. myself. But what I find, if I keep that balance, I can spiral out bigger and bigger and bigger, take on more work. When I take on more work, I also have more fun. I have fun, I hope you picked up on that. Yes. And then the other, <laughs> The other principles are, you know, that's kind of funny. You know, pick weights up off the ground, put them up overhead, and carry them. You know, drink water, eat veggies, eat protein. Uh, at the Olympic Training Center years ago, the nutritionist said, I don't know what the big deal is. Eat protein, eat veggies, and drink water. I don't know why everyone makes it a big deal. But what I found in life is that's absolutely true. Everybody knows the secret to success. Everybody knows. I mean, if I told you guys, buy low, sell high, you'd all go, mm-hmm. Mm. But that is how you make money with, you know, with goods. If I tell you to drink water, everyone nods, mm-hmm. Well, then do it. If I say sleep soundly. I read that somewhere, yeah. Mm, I, I, I read an article on that. <laughs> and you read in my uh, pocket feed this last two weeks, there's probably been 15 articles on sleep. And I, and I read them and go, how do you not know this? But they do. Everyone but knows. they no, yeah. ignore it. Mm. Folks, you know, the secret to life is, <laughs> uh, the great discus thrower John Powell used to always tell me, I said it was simple, not easy. You know, the, the secrets to life are simple, but they're not necessarily easy. Oh, there's my stomach. The, <laughs> my, uh, or mine. <laughs> yeah, my my 14-hour fast, 15-hour fast is kicking in. But uh, the secrets to life are very simple. But the funny thing is, I actually think they're also easy. Mm. Because once you, once you do this right, sleep soundly, it becomes pretty easy to wake up and fast mm. and drink water. And if you drink water, it's pretty easy to ignore that Coca-Cola or soda pop or whatever. And if you do this, you do... And all of a sudden, you get this momentum. You know, I'm a professor at two different universities in two different fields. And people go, how do you do that? And I'm like... Oh, you know what? I showed up on time to class, and then I, <laughs> and I listened to my professors, and when they told me to do an assignment, I did it, and I always turn it in early so I could get feedback. So if I had to turn it back in, and you, it just spirals. Mm. Be a slave to good habits. Who said that? Then that was the first time I met Coach Ralph Mon in person. We had talked on the <laughs> phone. I asked him, he, he said, the first time I met him, I go, what's the secret to throwing the discus for? He said, well, you need to lift weights three days a week, throw the discus four days a week for the next eight years. And most people miss the eight year part. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Everyone wants to do it in one year. And then at our first gathering, he said uh, two things. He said, number one, the secret to being a great track athlete is little and often over the long haul. Throw the discus four days a week, lift weights three days a week. But the next thing he said is, as a Division One athlete, you need to make yourself a slave to good habits. Mm -hmm. You know, he goes, you can't in May 
flip the switch. You need to sleep every day, even though you live in dorms, which is a nightmare. It's hard to sleep in dorms because there's always those idiots who are flunking out partying, always. You need to eat appropriately. You need to train every day. You need to show up to class. And at age 62, love me or hate me, I am a sum of my habits. And when someone says, God, you look 10 years younger, they're 20 years younger in the one case. Well, I want to tell them, honey, it's, it's, it's my, it's, it's the habits I set up in 1965 when I first started lifting weights. Uh, you can't, you can't magically, and that's what people do. They try to, so you here are the habits that you have. Oh, I don't like those habits. I want to do these habits. No. How many can you change in a week? Oh. Maybe one. In a month, I think you can change one. 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 Yeah. You can go from drinking no water to two glasses of water in a month. Right. When I tell people that, they're like, wait, that's... what? Do you mind if I go into just a little detail? Please. Just a tiny bit of detail. Please. When I work with someone who honestly needs my help, very often, the first month, all we have them do is drink, consciously drink two glasses of water a day. Now that's going to break your heart, because that's it. And I call you up at nine o'clock, and the joke is, bring, 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 because you're drinking the second glass of water. <laughs> the next month, all I ask you to do is we find a parking space as far from your office or place of work that we can find that you can park every day. And your job is to park there, mm -hmm. and that's it. Mm -hmm. And by the third month, people are, well, this doesn't matter. The habits are, it's like a snowball. They're getting bigger. Uh, week one, month three, your job is to put your shoes on, your, uh, your walking shoes on, and find a spot that you can see and walk to it and come back. That's week one. Well, actually, week one is just put the shoes on. Week two is opening the door, seeing a spot at your front door, and people go, this is silly. I can do so much more. Oh, really? For 40 years, you haven't done a darn thing. <laughs> I actually was going to say something. Uh, sorry, with an F right there. Uh, for... For 40 years, you haven't done a thing, and now you think that you're going to start training like a Navy SEAL. And then by the time we get to the end of that third month, their, their, their concept of habits has turned so much. My, um, I have worked with people, uh, it's, it's pounds, it's uh, losing 100 pounds in a year, 45 kilos mm -hmm. in a year. And what's weird is they don't lose any weight the first two, three months. All they're doing, and it's like, I, I, you, I need to lose these 45 kilos. Yeah, I know you do. But until we can get you to go, until we can get you to drink water, until we get you to think about walking, until we can get you to think about putting your shoes on. Mm -hmm. um, in one case, a guy lost the 45 kilos in a year and ran a half marathon on the anniversary of the first time we sat down. Now, I don't necessarily think a half marathon is good or bad. There's no judgment here. Mm. But that's pretty impressive. It is. Uh, another, <laughs> I got, got to be a little unspecific here, but another person who lost, actually it's more like 50 kilos in a year, which is stunning. Uh, people don't recognize the person. We'll, we'll have an event like my daughter's wedding mm. and the person shows up and uh, they'll be talking and then about halfway through, they'll lean in and go, oh my God, it's Tom Thomas? Yeah. <laughs> And there's this moment like, and it's very reassuring mm. for you, but at the same time you're like, who did people think I was before? Right. They did. And it takes, it honestly takes a minute or two of conversation to know that that's the person I've had a hundred parties with, been to their house, they don't recognize you. Oh. But you have to make yourself a slave to good habits. Mm. And it's much easier to do when you're five. When you're five years old, go to the dentist three times a year, floss your teeth, <laughs> sleep soundly, and just keep building that up year after year after year so that it's just, it is who you are. Mm. It's a great last sentence <laughs> to this interview then. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you much for that. So guys, um, um, Dan John, uh, lots of books. How many books, Dan? 14. 14 books out there. Um, look him up, uh, find his books, read his books, um, 
lots and lots of great advice you can use every day. And it's not about lifting uh, two kilos more or three kilos more. It's, it's, it's advice on, on, on more things that matter. And now, uh, please um, follow us and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of the awesome interviews and amazing training tips below in the dis uh, description section. So then, can we go down to the gym now and um, show me a few of your favorite lifts? Absolutely. Thank you very much. You bet. Thank you. Here we are in uh, Dan John's famous garage gym, uh, social uh, meeting point, whatever you call it, yeah. um, also museum. So, um, sorry, yeah. so we came down here with Dan, uh, he offered me to show me three things that he thinks are a must for everyone who wants to be moving better, feeling better. So what are those three things? Yeah, I have some really basic standards, you know, and one of them, and he's not going to be helpful, but uh, is, can you stand on one foot for 10 seconds? You know, and if you can't, we need to talk about this. Uh, and I have a bunch of ideas to improve it. The second standard I have, especially for adult males, can you hang for 30 seconds? Well, when most adult males do it, they think it's a challenge of grip. And what happens is they get in here and they're so messed up in their shoulders, but I can't do it because it's killing your shoulders because they're so locked up from here to here. The third standard is can you get into a goblet squat? And most can't because they're so locked up here. So if you don't mind, let's do the oh. first row and face the camera so we can make fun of you as your face gets. So really, and if, uh, usually we just put our feet up for it, okay? So what you'll notice here, and if you don't mind coming to the side, is that he can't do this unless he has mobility in this area here. Now, if he's damaged, if he's broken, he can't do it. What's interesting is just before you guys came here, I did this and I had one of the best cracks of my neck and back I've had in days. So mm. this is all it is. Now, here's the thing. It also challenges the grip. And we know that one of the signs of aging is losing grip strength. So it challenges the grip. Yes, yes it does. But for most adult males, it challenges all the brokenness here. I would suggest adding this to your training today. So the second thing I recommend for everybody is the hip thrust. Now, what you'll notice is that he has his hands in the ground, <laughs> and it's gonna sound weird, the wrong way. But most men I know spend their whole life in this position like this. So if you're doing exercises in this position, you're just exacerbating the problem. But what I asked him to do is turn his thumbs this way so he's rotating his shoulders out. And all, if, seriously, if you're just sitting in your chair, Take your thumbs and drive them backwards. If you feel a lot of tightness, hello, you've got issues with shoulder rotation. So he's going to dr drive his hands all the way back, to, his thumbs, I, I should say, all the way back to Australia. Now, the very simple drill is this. He's going to bring his butt up to the sky. He's going to squeeze his butt cheeks as tight as he can. And this is the glute bridge. Uh, you can hold this for 30 seconds. You can hold this for 60 seconds, and that's great. But to make the glutes work harder, I do suggest you try something else. Would you put your hands a vertical for me? Yep, a vertical is that way. Oh, sorry. Okay. <clears throat> Bring it up again. Now, find something, pull down as hard as you can. Find something you can pull down because the harder the ab wall works, the harder the glutes work. In other words, the harder the belly works, the harder the glutes work. They're connected. Good job. That simple little thing is a game changer for people to find out where their glutes are. Let's add one more little thing. Would you mind putting this around your knees? Say it, say it, please. About the knees? Yeah, perfect. And he's gonna lay on his back, thumbs correct. Push your knees out first, hard as you can. Okay, now bring your glutes up, squeeze hard, and push hard at the same time. I use Brett Contreras' glute loops. I'm sure you can find other things. 
Now, put your hands in the vertical for me and pull down. And what we're doing here is making the glutes work. It's simple, it's so simple, but it works really well, good. And now, let's make it harder. Relax, good. Simple, not easy. <laughs> Would you slide over to the hip thrust machine for me? Now, if you have, you can also do this as a, a do-it-yourself at home by using a low bench. When Brett Contreras first taught this to me, we were in a hotel lobby. Now, he got corrected by security for falling asleep in the hotel lobby. I'll tell you one thing, when you have seven large grown men doing this in a hotel lobby, the security guy walks out, looks, and then he sneaks back into his office praying we'll be gone soon. So Brett taught me this on a table in a hotel lobby. So that's, that's your nation. If you don't mind. So this time, we're going to add a little bit of band tension to it and do some reps with it also, okay? So uh, all the way back down, so just put that into that, uh, hook that underneath that one. So we're just using one easy blue band. And this looks a little bit like it's been thrown together, but actually it works really well. Yeah, well, let's uh, tell you what we'll do. You can, what we do sometimes is have him pull this to this, but to make it easy on him, We'll do it with just the easy black one. So put your hands vertical for me and grab these. Uh, grab this one, no, each one. Now, just do the pull down for me and bring it. Yeah, good. Now, knees, push those knees out and now start pumping some reps out for me. Go all the way down. There you go. Keep those hands in one place if you can. And now start pumping those hips. Push those knees out. <laughs> you want to do 300 of these, or maybe two more. And relax. Good. Good. And how was that? Very hard. <laughs> Much harder than Very it looked. Hard. So, folks, that's the hip thrust as we do it for an adult population. The nice thing, if you don't have all this equipment, just do them on the floor, but build it up over time. Uh, I think I think if you're gonna train at home, you start small. Maybe a, a kettlebell, like I have a, there's a kettlebell over there I've had for, oh, I think about almost 20 years now. It's the 28 kilo one. Yep. It's the first one I ever bought. With a 28 kilo kettlebell, I can do a thousand things. Then I add, would add a suspension system to it. Then I would add, then I would add, then I would add, and that's how you build a home gym. I'm a huge believer in home gyms uh, because my gym is always open and I don't have to mess with stupid people here, except for me. Um, something as simple as this, in America, this costs about $159. You can do dips, push-ups, and pull-ups on it. That's pretty inexpensive. This is an expensive device, but for my uses, I think it's, 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 it's an investment. Um, there you go. Hang from the bar, uh, glue your raises, or hip thrusts, okay? Okay, so, you hang, you, glute, you work your glutes on the hip thrust, and the third thing I think every adult male needs is this position here. This is the squat. The squat is maximal hip bend, maximal knee bend. We call this the six-point rock. Other people call it like a quadruped thing or something like that. But my problem with calling it a quadruped is that one, two, three, four, five, six is six, and quad is four. So, but that's just me studying Latin. Uh, <laughs> This is six point rock. Uh, years ago, I had a total hip replacement, and uh, keep going. And uh, my good friend Tim Anderson told me to do these to build my uh, mobility back up. If you can't squat, but you can do this, your issue is load, not movement. So I always start people right here, and that's all you need to do. One other small thing you might miss it: of our exercises, two of them start, or two of them are on the floor. Most adults never get on the floor. And so by throwing in this exercise and that hip thrust earlier, I'm getting my adults up and down off the ground. Excellent. Years ago, I tried to teach the squat to 65, 14 year old boys at once. And I tried a hundred different ways of teaching it. And I, and I think some of them were pretty successful. Um, this first variation was called the potato sack squat. And all I can ask the athlete to do 
is slide their forearms into the skin on the inside of their thigh. And they did that and it looked good, except the problem is when you go to the bottom, you hurt your fingers. So I came up with an idea, would you grab the kettlebell by the horns? Nice lift. So this the kettlebell, the ball, the handle, the horns. So what I asked the athlete to do is, would you put your left elbow inside your left knee and push out? And now take your right elbow and push your right knee out. Thank you. That's the goblet squat. Don't think about squatting. Think about pushing your knee out with your elbow, your knee out with your elbow. Now, a lot of people say, Dan, where did you get those armacondas? And what we're going to have, you remember how to do curls in this position? Yep. So he's just going to do a few curls. And what's happening here is as the load moves out, he's greasing up the hip joint without even knowing it. But I'm going to ask him to do an interesting thing now. Stay down at the bottom. Now, put, curl the weight to the ground. Okay, let it go. Now, I'm gonna put the stick right in front of you, let it go. Now, I'm gonna put the stick in front of you, let me, there you go. Now, grab it, oh, I don't know, maybe here. Grab the stick here, in here. Now, put it over your head. And now, stand up. Squat back down. Put the stick to the ground. To the ground. We have a, a these guys live in Australia, so we have different words for everything. Uh, grab the bell by the horns, stand up, up, down, curl the weight to the ground, grab the stick, and stand up, down, stick down. Now just keep doing that for a couple reps for me, okay? This exercise is going into the gobble squat into the overhead squat. And you'll notice, you might not see it, but I do. Every time he does this, his shoulder mobility gets a little bit better. And down. For the adult males I work with, this is the one that is the game changer in mobility. As this gets better, don't worry, I'm fine. You keep going. Uh, I, I can do this all day. Uh, this is the game. Oh, look at that. Barbell come over the head. What we're discovering right here is that the body is one piece. As the hip area loosens up, the shoulder area loosens up. Look at that position now. Would you mind bringing the camera to this side for me? Look at that shoulder mobility. See how the bar now is behind him? And go back down. Excellent. Bar to the ground. Curl it up. Stand up and bar down and be done, and be done. Remember you told me you couldn't overhead squat? You just did perfect. Thank you. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't your shoulders. Yeah. It was something else. Right. But if we fix, if you have a broken toe, you can't throw a ball or even kick a ball. It's not because you, this foot's wrong, there's something wrong here. The body is one piece. So when you're training an adult client, the biggest mistake people have in this 2019, 2020, and is we still think we're Frankenstein's monster. Arm day, leg day, abs. No, you're one piece. If you have diarrhea, it's not a good day to back squat. Okay? <laughs> your body's one piece. So what we discovered there is not your shoulder flexibility, it was something else. And I don't care what it was because now you're lubed and ready to move. All right. Hang from the bar hip thrust, goblet squat variations. Those are the big three in my world. Dan, thank you very much. And so this is all I get out of coming to America um, and then driving 1,700 kilometers. It was well worth it. So here you are. <laughs>